And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. This great book of Hosea, what does it mean? Salvation. And it lays the groundwork for you for salvation. Ultimately, it would be Christ that would come being called Yeshua, which is to say God's Savior. But these are the rules. First, number one, the knowledge of God. Number two, repentance and learning the love of God. And that being all taught, all three of those steps into salvation, well and rightly named the book of Hosea, meaning salvation in the Hebrew tongue. So we, we, we're talking here basically uh, to the 10 tribes of Israel. When you hear the larger of the tribes, Ephraim, it's all inclusive of the 10. So you want to take that into consideration. As we closed in the last lecture, in regard to the ten, 10 northern tribes, then Benjamin was the farthest south, meaning if the, if the Assyrian was already down where Benjamin was, they'd been had, okay? They were going into captivity. So we pick it up there with chapter 5, verse 9, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, and it reads... Um, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke, when this comes to pass. Among the tribes of Israel have I made no one that which shall surely be. Now, this is important that you hang on to that. That should be a very, very comforting thought to you. Let me read that last sentence again. Have I made no one that which shall surely be means through the prophets i foretell you all things so you should nothing should be a surprise to you that's why it's important as we learned in chapter 4 to have the knowledge of god and the fact that god's children perish for the lack of knowledge it is written the plan of god it shall come to pass exactly as it is written that's what he's saying here. Verse 10 to continue. The princes of Judah, we switch now from the ten tribes to the house of Judah. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. That's to say the boundaries. They keep moving them. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. They keep moving those boundaries. God doesn't like that. He loves his children he always treats his children fairly, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. Verse 11, Ephraim, back to the ten tribes, is oppressed and broken in judgment. You can see what God's opinion is. Old Jeroboam building the, creating the two golden calves and telling people, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. Worship right here. Worship these golden calves instead of God. Because he willingly walked after the commandment. What commandment? The false commandment of Jeroboam saying, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. We have this religion at Samaria. Watch Mountain. It's right here. All you have to do is take in this false doctrine. Now, I won't go into the Easter bunnies and quick like a rabbit and all that kind of stuff that has eased its way into the Christian church from this same type of stuff. It isn't necessary. Intelligent people know it. Because why? They don't lack knowledge from our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> they willingly, willingly followed after false teachings. And it seemed that people just sup it up. Well, he had credentials. Credentials from who? Is, is God's Word taught there chapter by chapter and verse by verse? I don't care what kind of credentials you have, and that may shake somebody up for me. If you don't, if you are a representative of, t a, 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 of the teachers of God's Word, and you never get around to teaching God's Word, you're a bust. You're worthless. You're fit for nothing. That's why God says, in my eyes, you've had it. 
speaking of the judgment on Jeroboam and those that work in other things rather than the word of God, false commandments. Verse 12, Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth. You know, a little old moth is a little thing, but boy, it can sure tear up expensive clothing. And to the house of Judah as rottenness, that's to say as a worm. I, I can work on them, and I will work on them. If, if you're not pleasing to God, he will correct you. Verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness, thank goodness he at least saw it. And Judah saw his wound, he should have. Then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound. In other words, um, uh, what is the word Jerob? What does it translate? Uh, some would disagree on this, but I can tell you it's, it, it is the uh, adversary. That's one of Satan's names. Satan doesn't heal. He puts on a Band-Aid of lies, patches it up, makes you feel better, but it's a bunch of lies. <clears throat> he said, to Ephra, I mean, you, he's already passed Benjamin, the Assyrian is, and naturally, as you well know, the ten tribes went into the captivity of the Assyrian and uh, were uh, 200 years before the house of Judah would be taken by the king of Babylon. Verse 14, For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. Do you know what a lion does? You know, a canine will bite off and close off the vascular system and cause its victim to die. A lion doesn't do that. A lion rips and tears and destroys. God said, that's what I'm going to do. Forget the little moth and the worm. Like a lion, I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. And um, as you notice, a uh, young lion to the house of Judah, both ways. <clears throat> when God is unhappy with his children, he corrects them. Actually, that's a sign of his love. When he ceases correcting, that means he doesn't love you anymore. Then you really have trouble. Verse 15, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense, until they realize they lack knowledge and acknowledge the fact <clears throat> and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. Well, um, and, and so they do. But what do they seek? Uh, let, let's, let's use a, an analogy from the New Testament. Let's take the second advent when Christ returns. And they run to him, oh, thank you, Jesus, for returning. We've cast out demons in your name. We've, we've healed in your name. And Jesus said, just hold it right there. Get out of my sight. I never knew you. Who, who were they healing in the name of? The adversary? False teachers? You know, Christ won't be played the fool. Well, Jesus, we were just rolling a few eggs of fertility when, on the day you were crucified. The day you shed your blood so that we could have forgiveness. We've got a quick bunny here. You think he's going to buy that? I, I know that I may offend some, and I'm out winning friends and influencing people, but this, it upsets our Father. It hurts his feelings when false teachings work in especially to the high day of Christianity and practice heathenistic rituals in the house of God and by God's children. He said, don't worry. When the time comes, they're going to seek me early. But there's some of them are going to get turned away and disappointed. The, uh, the thought continues right on into chapter 6, verse 1. When they seek him early, what will they be saying? Verse 1. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. Uh, 
He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Uh, he'll help us out of this voice of deception where people have deceived us, uh, where we listen to the adversary, King Jared, Jared, brother, than who we're supposed to be listening to. Listen to old Jeroboam, our king, earthly king, to worship two calves. It's idolatry. Anything that comes between you and God in falsehood is idol worship. There may not be an idol standing there, but when you begin to speak and mouth like a heathen and heathen practices in Christianity, that's idol worship. Verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now there is a time in his sight. Well, what does that mean? When he returns. Well, in two days, three days, what happens? That's the two witnesses when they rise from the streets of the Pata, let me say it correctly, in Jerusalem, the arena. And, and uh, people realize at that time that um, the true Christ has returned. And they'll seek him, all right. I wonder how many of them will have a mortal soul and how many will have an immortal soul. That's where the big difference comes in. A mortal soul means a soul that may die on judgment. An immortal soul is one that God has already given his blessings to eternal life. Verse 3. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. That's knowledge, that we have knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former reign unto the earth. That's a promise. That's how it's going to happen. Not maybe he'll return to us, he shall. And that is the second advent. Uh, just as sure what it's saying is, let's just bring it right on down to just simple old English. Just as sure as the sun comes up in the morning, he's going to return. And he will not only bring, and he will bring us the rain of truth. What does the former rain do? Think of the parable of the sower for a moment, if you will. The former rain is the rain, the moisture that when you sow something, it germinates and sprouts the little seed, whereby it grows into a beautiful plant. And, and there it goes on its way to success. But if it doesn't rain on it anymore, guess what happened? It blasts in the field. It dries up. It will never produce fruit. But he, when he rains the truth of the latter rain, it causes the plant to continue its beautiful growth and brings on the product of the plant, which is to say the fruit, where it's productive. It amounts to something. And that's why you have to have the truth from God's word of both the, the um, former rain, that's the rain that germinates the seed in your mind of truth, knowledge, and then that that causes it to grow whereby you have understanding of our Heavenly Father, His love, His leadership, His caring, His judgment. You know, judgment for those that love God is blessings. It's payday, friend, and that's the end of the eternity. Verse 4, O Ephraim, ten tribes again, what shall I do unto you? Uh, your love is fickle. That's what he's saying. What will I do to you, thee? O, o Judah, what shall I do unto thee? Question. For your goodness, that's to say your love, is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. In other words, you're parched. The ground is parched. It needs rain bad. A morning cloud comes up. It clouds up, and as soon as the hot sun hits it, it's gone. In other words, 
you don't amount to a hill of beans. You don't, you're just a, you look nice and pretty, but then just poof, you're nothing. He said, you're fickle to me. You see, as you've heard me say many times, you better know and understand coming out the gate what it is God wants from you. And he has just told you he wants your love, and he doesn't want it to be fickle. He wants to know that if the going gets a little rough, you're going to say, let's, Father, use me. Plow, let's plow on through it. Let's get it done. He wants your love. And he wants to be able to trust you that from the former rains all the way through to the latter rains, he knows he can trust you and depend upon you. Verse 5, Therefore, God continues, have I hewed, I've, uh, I've sown, okay? No Anglo-Saxon word. I've, I've sown them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. I've threatened them, okay? Warned them. And thy judgments are as the light that cometh forth. You can count on it. Just as sure as the sun comes up and goes down, I'm going to judge you. Now, if your love is fickle, friend, you're in trouble. If, if your love for Almighty God is fickle, he's, he's swearing to you here, I'm going to judge you, not the whole nation or anything else, individually even. Verse 6, this I refer to ever so often, this particular verse. Chapter 6, verse 6 of Hosea. Do you want to know what God desires from you? And don't you ever, ever forget it. This makes all the difference in the world to him if you absorb this. Don't be fickle. Verse 6, for I desired mercy. That's to say love. That, this is Father pouring his heart out to you. I desired love and not sacrifice. He said, I don't, your burnt offerings don't mean that much to me. It's just obedience to the fact. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I want you to receive my knowledge whereby I can count on you and you'll be fit for something. I can use you. Otherwise, you're worthless. My friend, you will never read a scripture that will help you better understand what it is Almighty God through his ever deeper and deeper emotions wants from you than in that verse. I desire your love. That's what the word mercy in Hebrew means as it's used here. I desire your love. More, far more than your burnt offerings, your dead animals, sacrificed animals. I'm not, knacking, I'm not knocking sacrifice, but what he wants is sacrificial love to him, not fickle, tested over a period of time, former rain and latter rain, beginning to the end, from A to Z in your life, a love that he can count on. That's what he wants. Will he get it? Probably. Uh, I, I wish I could say some of us were perfect. We're not. But what is important, that's what he wants. If you want to touch him, if you want to be led by him, if you want to be used by him, you will always remember Hosea, Salvation 6.6. 6. Verse 7. But they, like men, or like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. Okay, they rebelled against it. There have they dealt treacherously against me. They, they, they turn from my word. I can't count on them. Eight. Gilad, that's, that's a very rocky region, is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. What it's, the word polluted means 
the city has got bloody tracks, heel marks, all over it. Like you can track them and trace them by where they walk. Okay. And um, um, they're, um, it's supposed to be a city of refuge. Do you know what that is? Back from, from uh, you're supposed to have three cities of refuge, and if somebody accidentally harms someone, a person can flee to that city and they're safe there in that place. But it was also a priest city. Supposed to be a city of the priest where you would expect the best kindness and compassion. But according to God, that's sure not what you get. Verse 9. Bloody tracks. Verse 9. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. Uh, very near here is a place called Shechem, which means they rip the, it was calf worship, but also they, they, it's the back, and they rip the shirt right off your back. You know, he said, I don't, I don't send out beggars. And all these priests do is rip the people off. What was the subject? He doesn't want sacrifice of offerings. He wants your love. And he said, these priests don't make it clear. They don't make it known. In this particular place that is supposed to be a refuge from harm, and even a priest city where you would expect better, they're a bunch of thieves, a bunch of beggars, always got their hand out. Let's do something religious. Let's pass the plate be before, in the middle, and after. And uh, I know there will be some that will say, well, boy, is he sacrilegious. No, that's, I'm sorry, that's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Hey, if the old shoe fits, you put her on and you wear her, right real snug, friend. God wants your love. You're either going to give it to him or you're not because love generates and develops within each entity and goes out to him. He will never force it. He won't try to buy it. He won't try to con you. Your love for him is either real or all about you is fake. It's up to you. Up to you. Let's go on with the next verse. Verse 10. I have seen an horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whoredom, the idolatry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. They worship in golden calves and other things, traditions of men that are worked into the church that have nothing to do with uh, studying God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you know the, and have the knowledge, possess the knowledge of God. My people perish for lack of knowledge and naturally knowledge of our Father. Verse 11. Also, O Judah, going from the ten tribes now to the house of, Israel, of Judah. Also, O Judah, he hath set an harvest for thee. When I return the captivity of my people... Don't get too carried away. It's a harvest of punishment, correction. God keeps things even. God has uh, love and desires just like anyone. And he does not keep it hidden. He has made it very clear in this sixth chapter what he wants from you. You know, naturally... If your father is pleased with you, you're kind of in better standing. And if he isn't, there's something wrong. So listen to your heavenly father. Please him, and I guarantee you he will please you. When you have the knowledge of God to know and understand what he's going to use you for, then let him shape you up. And may he 
uh, treat the iron of your soul whereby it is tempered and treated until it is hard enough to accomplish what it is he needs done without wilting like a hothouse lily on some poor me baby trip. All he wants is for you to love him enough to listen, to listen to him and to let him know. I mean, you've got to speak it. You don't even have to speak it out loud. A lot of people feel that saying I love you shows weakness. That's, that comes not so much anymore as it used to. Used to, you just, you know, love was not showing the way it should be. And uh, so um, it, uh, love is the strongest force in the world. It, it is demanded whether present or absent. It's always there, and it should always be there for our Father. Chapter 7 and verse 1, it reads, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. Uh-oh. And the wickedness of Samaria, this was the capital of the ten tribe nation, remember? Okay. For they committed falsehood. And the thief cometh in, and the troop of Roger, robbers spoileth without. They stripped it clean bare. Anytime that you drift off into falsehood, what happens? Now, I want you to picture this in your mind. It's what God wants you to picture. God has already promised you in this book what would happen if you turned to falsehood. He's pulling out. He's gone. In other words, your protector and he that blesses you has pulled out, which means you're not going to receive any blessings until something changes. And he says, uh, first of all, don't forget what happened at Samaria. It's important. Instead of going to Jerusalem, which they were supposed to make the trip, it's not all that far, really. You, you just stay right here and worship here. Worship these two calves if you must. That, that was so ignorant, so uh, against our Heavenly Father, that when you bring heathenistic practices into the church, then the spoilers and the robbers will show up from everywhere. Why? Because God's pulled out. He's not going to help you. He's not going to protect you. Verse 2. And they consider not in their hearts, their minds, that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings, whose? Their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. Don't think I don't keep my eye on them. Just because he pulls out doesn't mean that he watches and knows. Hey, it goes in the book, friend. The book of life. Uh, what kind of record do you have? What's, what does your rap sheet say up there? I hope it's positive. Because everybody lives and is judged by a rap sheet. Maybe I shouldn't use the word rap sheet, but I, th I like it. I, it'll, it'll work. That's for the bad stuff, okay? Uh, verse 3. They make the king glad, not our heavenly father earthly king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. In other words, the whole bunch. In other words, it was King Jeroboam that molded the two calves. It was the King Jeroboam, which being translated from the Hebrew means uh, he who of many people. Why? Because he was the king of Israel, the ten tribes, not Judah, two from the south. And he misled the whole bunch. But there is one thing you want to be very careful of. Well, it was the king's fault. That's not what God said. It's your own doings. In other words, you have the word of God and you have the knowledge. You should not allow some man calling himself a preacher, priest, uh, teacher, or whatever to take the place of the Word of God. You should be familiar in it. By your own doings, 
Everybody sells their own chip. You, well, I took advice from so-and-so. You're the one that, that took that advice and run it through your little mill here and made your decision, and your decision is what you live by. If it was bad advice, you should have culled it. By your own doings, he said. So don't, don't get, this is why I do not like to see people get on a poor me baby trip, you know. I mean, you're something special. You're a child of God. Act like it. Now, let's go with the next verse, verse uh, 4. They are all adulterers. That's idolaters. Um, as an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from rising after he hath kneaded the dough until it is leavened. A baker heats the oven, you knead the dough. Do you know what happens if you knead the dough when you've made it up? It's yeast bread, okay? It's got leaven in it, yeast. And if you give it a little time and it rises up. But if you just stick it in the hot oven too quick, it kills it, okay? Verse 5. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick. With bottles of wine, he stretched out his hand with scorners. Uh, he drinks with those that mock God. That's what it says. Who mocks God more than anyone else? The Kenites do. That's why he said they strip you. If you aren't careful, they'll come right into the middle. Verse 6. For they have made ready their heart, that's to say their brain, their mind, like an oven. While they lie in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. Um, okay, uh, in the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. You with companion Bibles, you're very fortunate because you're going to see that um, um, an, a leaf and an an are crossed up in this and it's mistranslated. The word baker should be anger. They lie there and their anger heats all night long. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire uh, between an alien and an leaf. For you with companion Bibles, I, I won't try to even explain it. Uh, uh, go there and uh, they're interchanged and it caused the difference between anger and uh, baker, okay? Seven to complete this lecture, verse seven. They are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges, that's to say God's elect that would share the truth with them. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. They're rather too busy following the false teachings and getting lined up for Antichrist. They don't wish to hear the truth. Uh, you know, we live in a time when hotheads uh, run about. You can always be calm with the exception of righteous indignation. That can get your, feet, uh, your pressure going just a little bit, and it's well-deserved at times. But um, uh, never let it be for a false reason, okay? That, that does you no good. Our Father, what does He want from you? I don't want you to ever forget that. Your love. Why? He's got feelings just like you do. When you love someone, you want that love returned. Well, he loves you. He wants you to return that love. That's not asking too much. That's just natural. Don't forget it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?